Welcome back to our uh, noon series. And um, today we have a very interesting speaker. But before I introduce our today's speaker, let me tell you that our next talk will be on January the 18th. And uh, um, it will be Jeffrey Kahn, um, who graduated from the University of Michigan Law School uh, and worked, uh, was associate, um, uh, graduate stu uh, was associated with, uh, with our center. And uh, Jeff will be talking about uh, his findings uh, in, Hadar in the Khodorkovsky and Lebedev's case. Uh, he uh, wrote a report for the Medvedev, for the President Medvedev uh, Human Rights Council, and um, uh, his findings were recently discussed in uh, Moscow in the Council, and he will talk us about uh, his uh, report that he submitted. Uh, he will tell us about his report that he submitted to uh, the President. So it will be an exciting event again on uh, January eight, the 18th. And it's part of our series, uh, the 20, 20 years after the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, today, our speaker is Arsen Saparov. Arsen is a, a Monogan Foundation postdoctoral fellow. Um, Arsen, um, research, Arsen's research focus, focus is post-Soviet developments, conflicting relations, relationships, uh, relations, territorial dispute, disputes uh, in the Southern Caucasus. Um, Arsen received his PhD in international relations from the London School of Economics in 2007. Then the, he spent two years uh, conducting his postdoctoral research in uh, CNRS in Paris. And now he's here with us. And we are very excited to have him present uh, his work. Um, Arsene is, uh, is currently uh, working on his book, Why Autonomy? The Bolsheviks and the Creation of Ethnic Autonomies in the Southern Caucasus from 1918 to 1936. Um, Please join me in welcoming uh, Arsene. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for coming to this uh, lecture. I'm uh, especially grateful to the Chris Center for inviting me, and uh, I would like also to express my uh, great uh, like to kind of thank uh, the Armenian Center as well. Uh, the title, I mean, I have to kind of reinstate the title of today's lecture is uh, "Arbitrary Borders," and I'm going to uh, focus. To the next to the mic. Okay, uh, I'll try to. Uh, understand uh, what were the reasons uh, for the boundary creations in the South Caucasus in early 20s by the Bolsheviks. I mean, I put this map uh, because it's a very uh, good snapshot of the region. And it, uh, if you look at the map, you see the uh, red dotted areas, uh, which are conflict areas uh, where conflicts uh, occurred in, uh, at the time of a breakup of the Soviet Union. And these are autonomous regions of Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, so it's very uh, inviting and very uh, easy to uh, immediately uh, suspect that the boundaries of these conflict areas were drawn uh, with a purpose. And the purpose was a sinister purpose, uh, namely to create boundaries so that you can control uh, the Union Republic. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, obviously these conflicting areas uh, were inflamed and uh, broke into conflicts. Uh, especially striking are cases of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and South Ossetia because uh, before establishment of uh, Soviet Union in the early 20s, uh, these regions did not exist as, uh, uh, as administrative units. Uh, in case of Karabakh, there was in early 19th century there was Hanat, but later on, uh, uh, no territory of this uh, shape ever existed in uh, Tsarist Russia. 
and in case of a city, it's, uh, it's uh, not even an administrative entity existed in 19th century. So why would Bolsheviks create these uh, ethnically defined regions within uh, uh, Georgia and Azerbaijan? If it was not for divide and rule, uh, what else? Uh, uh, and I think the uh, divide and rule approach to this question is probably the most dominant nowadays. I mean, if you if you Google uh, uh, Stalin and borders in the Caucasus, I mean, you probably will get hundreds of, of, of hits right now. Uh, let's say, uh, for example, Shirin Hunter uh, thinks that uh, the borders uh, that Bolsheviks deliberately drew internal frontiers in the Caucasus as to create leverage against republics. So that's probably the most uh, uh, well-known, the best well-known explanation these days. Another explanation is uh, if it was not uh, for a deliberate manipulation of uh, boundaries and ethnicities, then it probably was uh, economic considerations. So the logic, he the logic here is, is that the Bolsheviks uh, gave preference to their economic ideas over the uh, treatment of uh, minority groups. Uh, and uh, I'd like to challenge both of these views uh, in today's uh, presentation. Uh, uh, but before I get into uh, my arguments against uh, uh, using these uh, discourses in understanding the boundaries, I have to say that obviously the conflicts that uh, occurred in early 90s, uh, late 80s, early 90s, uh, attracted a lot of academic attention and particularly the attention was uh, drawn to the boundaries. I mean, I know at least uh, four uh, volumes uh, which dealt exclusively, pretty much exclusively, with the question of boundaries. Uh, one was uh, entitled Transcaucasian Boundaries, uh, the whole volume was devoted to that, and another was work uh, collection against of essays uh, entitled Contested Borders in the Caucasus. There were two other which didn't directly deal with it, but still had uh, some aspects uh, concerning the South Caucasian boundaries. Uh, my problem with these books is that uh, they did not answer the question uh, how the boundaries were drawn or uh, what was the logic behind it. These books, I mean, you, you should kind of uh, uh, take into consideration that these were published in the early 90s, so very fresh out of Soviet Union, so the discussion was mainly historical. Uh, and today I try to understand the logic of creating these uh, ethnographically, ethnically defined regions within uh, within bigger republics. Uh, what I propose here is uh, to think about uh, uh, the boundary ma the boundary making practices on two levels. I would I would call it a two tier approach. Uh, uh, in one case, I think uh, uh, this two 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 level approach two tier approach uh, can explain. Uh, a controversy of uh, which seems like a controversy, which seems like a conspiracy to create uh, ethnically defined boundaries. Uh, uh, I would call the first level uh, an allocation level. I mean, it's actually in boundary studies. Uh, this is a defined term. So, uh, and the second level is a delimitation level. My argument is that. Uh, at two levels, two different logic uh, logics were applied, and uh, 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 the uh, on each level, uh, two different, completely different goals were pursued by the by the Bolshevik uh, leadership. Uh, so let me just move into allocation level. Uh, the allocation level, uh, which decides pretty much who gets what, uh, uh, was uh, completed in 1921. But I I need to kind of jump. Uh, three years uh, in the past uh, to very briefly uh, just to kind of sketch the history of the region. Uh, so when uh, the Tsarist Empire collapsed, the region separated and uh, later on it separated into three states uh, which were fighting each other over uh, territories pretty much. All three years uh, were characterized by conflict between Armenia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia, uh, Georgia, Abkhazia, there were conflicts in South Ossetia, etc., etc., etc. So when the Bolsheviks uh, captured the region in 1920, 1921, 
uh, uh, they had this uh, a complete mess uh, in a way. Uh, and they uh, didn't know how to deal with it. An interesting thing is uh, the external boundaries of this region uh, were decided quite quite uh, quickly uh, in March 1921. Just have in mind, let's say, Georgia uh, was Sovietized, the Bolsheviks invaded Georgia in February 1921, and the external boundary was decided already in March. This was the boundary between uh, Bolshevik Russia and uh, Kemalist Turkey. Uh, at that point, uh, the Bolshevik leadership, I mean, they were probably still very naive. They thought that uh, the internal boundaries would be uh, an easy problem to decide. So initially, they invited a conference in Tbilisi, in Georgian capital Tbilisi, in, uh, in June uh, 1921. And they assumed that uh, this conference, uh, in a very friendly manner, because uh, now we had uh, a not uh, nationalist and bourgeois uh, leadership of, uh, you know, Dashnaks, uh, Musavatists and Mensheviks, but uh, all this uh, nice uh, communist leadership, they will, you know, solve this problem in a very friendly manner. And I've read the uh, minutes of this uh, conference, and it was quite funny because it actually was a very nasty and uh, not very pleasant quarrel between the three leaders of Armenia, of Soviet Armenia, Soviet Azerbaijan, and Soviet Georgia. Uh, initially, it was thought that the uh, solution would be, you know, you just have one person from Kav Bureau, and, you know, the leaders will decide uh, it in a friendly manner. And after the first day of scandal, they had to invite uh, Orjinikidze to oversee it. And after the second day, it became clear uh, that there won't be any solution. So the Bolsheviks had this problem. They solved the external boundaries. They had to solve internal boundaries. Now, one thing is, uh, is often uh, not uh, noticed that uh, the Bolsheviks in 1921, uh, their position was not as powerful as, let's say, in 1937. As they actually didn't have enough troops in the region and they had to make a lot of compromises. And when they were capturing the region, they made a lot of promises. And these promises were pursuing a very short-term goals. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, when they captured Azerbaijan, they assured Azerbaijan will get Karabakh. But then they needed to capture Armenia, and they were making promises to Armenians that Karabakh will be Armenian. So when the region was captured, they had a whole bunch of promises like that which were actually contradictory promises. Uh, the other problem, they had approximately 20,000 troops, uh, which was not enough to pacify region and uh, enforce their unconditional will. And the third problem, which I see, is that the local leadership in this uh, situation of still unsettled internal frontiers obviously were pursuing their own goal. So this Bolshevik leadership was facing all these three problems, and. Uh, in theory, they had two solutions, how to decide these problems. One solution uh, could have been uh, uh, to uh, say, okay, well, we uh, separate the conflicting regions. So let's say uh, we decide that uh, Ossetians uh, get independence because they want independence and they were oppressed by the Georgians. And let's say Karabakh Armenians would uh, become part of uh, Armenia. And let's say Abkhaz would, you know, uh, become part of Russia as Abkhaz wanted. And the problem with this solution uh, was that uh, actually Karabakh was controlled by Azerbaijan, uh, South Ossetia was controlled by Georgia, and just before the Bolshevik invasion, uh, Georgians controlled Abkhazia. So if they went along this kind of uh, separation logic, they would alienate uh, Azerbaijan and Georgia, and they couldn't do that. They couldn't afford it. Uh, because, as I said, they didn't have enough troops and that would undermine the legitimacy in these countries. Uh, on the other hand, they had a problem. They couldn't uh, just, you know, say uh, to Ossetians, who were actually the very big Bolshevik supporters, or Karabakh Armenians, or Abkhazet, forget it, guys. I mean, you are, uh, you know, uh, an internal, uh, in in integral part of uh, Georgia and Azerbaijan. So in these situations, they adopted a solution uh, which would be uh, probably feasible in this uh, situation. They decided, okay, 
uh, the guys who control this disputed territory will keep it. But on condition that the minority groups that was causing all these troubles will be granted an autonomy. And uh, this I call a uh, allocation uh, stage. And the allocation stage, when the decisions uh, who gets what were actually taken, uh, concluded uh, very early. Uh, okay, they captured the region in February, and the last allocation decision was in October. So half a year. Uh, if you want the dates, uh, I can give you the exact dates. Let's say the allocation on Abkhazia was decided on 31st of March, 1921. Uh, Nagorno-Karabakh allocation decision was decided on July 5th, and uh, South Ossetia was decided, was last one to be decided, was on October 31st, 1921. And so now we move to the next stage, which is uh, delimitation. So they decided that uh, Georgia keeps uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, Azerbaijan keeps Karabakh. Now it's time to decide the internal boundaries. Interestingly enough, uh, the delimitation stage took much longer. Depending what you uh, consider a final decision on delimitation, uh, it either lasted until 1925, so four years, or until 1921, uh, 1929, I'm sorry. So in one case, you can have uh, four years of deciding the delimitation or almost uh, nine years. Yeah, nine years. Um, uh, an interesting part uh, about delimitation, uh, when you look at it, is that uh, delimitation actually occurred along uh, ethnic boundaries mostly. Uh, another question, why do you think it took, uh, so I, I was thinking, okay, why did it took the Bolsheviks so long to uh, accomplish the limitation? I mean, they controlled the regions, they were in charge of it. Why it dragged for so long? <clears throat> My understanding is that uh, there was a very, very big opposition from Georgia and Azerbaijan against granting uh, the autonomous status to these minority groups. Uh, in case of Karabakh, uh, I mean, you look at the documents, there were very, very uh, tough negotiations about it. The other thing which is quite surprising is that uh, the Bolsheviks were very, very uh, stubborn and very firm about their decision to grant uh, these minority territories uh, and a status that they promised in 1921. This is especially striking if you compare it with, let's say, the promises they were making in uh, when they were capturing region. So if if they if uh, they could promise Ossetians that they would be independent in 1920, and then they had to kind of make them part of Georgia, same promises were made in case of Karabakh. Then it's very striking that uh, after the decision was taken that there will be an autonomy. They actually uh, decided to stick with this decision. I don't have a very uh, documented explanation, so it's just logical. Uh, I'm trying to understand it from the logical point of view. I think what they had, uh, what they faced was the problem of uh, legitimacy. If, uh, if they didn't grant autonomy to South Ossetia and Karabakh and Abkhazia, uh, that would greatly undermine their legitimacy not only among the population of these autonomous regions, but also in a, uh, from the point of view of, uh, of uh, leadership of Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia. So they had to uh, basically implement what they promised in order to uh, preserve their uh, legitimacy and authority. So that's kind of my take on, uh, on this complicated issue of boundaries. There is another uh, very... Uh, a big but not probably as big as uh, the divide and rule approach is economic considerations. So uh, some argue that uh, actually this was not done, the delimitation of these uh, internal boundaries was not done along uh, divide and rule lines or it didn't have this uh, sinister logic, uh, conspiracy logic, but actually it was following an economic pattern. So the argument here is uh, there was a very big economic design uh, in Moscow, and uh, these kind of decisions were following this economic logic. 
Uh, I see two levels in this argument. I mean, not two levels, but uh, two kind of explanations why people use this. Uh, in f uh, first of all, uh, in all three cases, when you see at the discussions at the allocation level, especially at the crucial moments, the local leadership would bring up uh, the economic argument. Uh, in case of uh, Georgia and Ossetian boundary, economic argument uh, was uh, very frequently used by both sides. Ossetians were saying, well, we need uh, the capital town of Tsin Valley because economically it's very important for South Ossetia. And the Georgians were saying, but these parts of South Ossetia are economically linked to Georgia, therefore we should not give it to you. When Abkhaz were forced into union with Georgia, again, economic argument featured quite, quite prominently in the discussions. Same with Karabakh, uh, pretty much everyone who uh, writes about Karabakh mentions that there were nomadic movements of uh, <coughs> nomads living in the plains of Karabakh into the mountains, and that was one of the reasons why uh, this was decided in favor of Azerbaijan. I'm a bit doubtful about sincerity of uh, Bolshevik leadership uh, of these uh, regions when they were bringing up economic argument. Uh, the reason is that uh, I didn't see a very big uh, chunk of economically related documents that would uh, point out at the you know acute economic problems. These kind of arguments were. Uh, surfaced at a very crucial, decisive moment. So I think it was more like uh, they were using economic argument to advance their territorial claims because it was, you know, uh, much uh, friendlier and close to the Bolshevik uh, thinking that to use economic argument rather than nationalist argument. Uh, the second uh, problem, and this is on a bigger level, uh, which argues that. Uh, it was uh, part of the general policy of uh, economic raci rationalization that these territories were, you know, left where they were. In other words, that uh, Karabakh had economic links with Azerbaijan, that's why it was left in Azerbaijan. Uh, South Ossetia had economic links with Georgia, that's why it was left in Georgia, and same goes for Abkhazia. So if it was uh, such a very uh, grand and big design, I have two questions. Uh, uh, why in some cases, in some allocation cases, uh, the economic logic is not present? Actually, there is no economic logic whatsoever. Uh, the best way to illustrate this is to show you uh, uh, the case of Nahichavan, which is here, and Zangezur, which is here. So Nahichavan went to Azerbaijan, even so, as you can see on the map, it has no connection with it. And all economic activity was directed towards uh, former Yerevan gubernia, which is here. So in this allocation case, there is absolutely no economic logic. It runs actually contrary to economic logic. And same goes for Zang Yezur, which was attached to Armenia, but until uh, well into mid-20s, there was no direct road connecting Armenia with Zang Yezur. So it had all economic connections and all uh, routes leading to Azerbaijan. So if you try to apply economic logic, uh, yeah, it works in case of Karabakh, it works in case of Abkhazians, and uh, maybe uh, in case of South Ossetia and maybe Abkhazia, but at the same time it uh, completely doesn't work in, in other cases. So I don't think the economic logic was present here. My second argument is uh, look at, this, uh, at the economy of these regions. Nagorno-Karabakh had an economy of uh, Armenians growing some wine and uh, uh, Azerbaijan is uh, involved in uh, pastoral nomadism. There was no industry. For the Bolsheviks, uh, they were mostly interested in proletariat. Look at South Ossetia. The Ossetians were growing potatoes. I mean, there was no industry in South Ossetia. Uh, so I'm asking, were the Bolsheviks really interested in these backward uh, regions where there was no proletariat? Uh, was it an important kind of uh, regional case for them? I think it wasn't. What I s uh, but does it, does it mean that uh, the economic logic was completely absent? Mm, I, I, I think the economic logic was very much present in the Bolshevik uh, decision making, but it was not operating on this level. Uh, it was not operating on a level of, uh, you know, some 
uh, potato growers or uh, wine producing guys or nomads. It was working on a much bigger scale. Uh, in terms of economics, the Bolsheviks saw entire South Caucasus, as they used to call it uh, Transcaucasia at that time, as one economic unit. And to prove that, uh, look what happened in 1922. They forced all three republics to join in one economic union. So I do think economic was present there. Uh, but it was not on a such small level of Nagorno-Karabakh, South Ossetia, Abkhazia. From the Bolshevik point of view, if they were thinking in terms of economics, uh, this was a nuisance, this was an annoyance. I mean, you just grant these guys an autonomy, but economically they were thinking on a bigger level. So I think uh, the economic considerations are not uh, valid either. Now let me just move into a more practical aspect of uh, boundary making. Uh, as I said, uh, the books that were published in uh, uh, mid-90s uh, had mostly historical accounts of uh, not even boundaries, but the history of regions. They didn't have any boundary kind of related questions. And I think actually the Bolsheviks themselves, they didn't have a text, uh, a blueprint of how to draw a boundary. Uh, at least I never found in archives any kind of uh, resolutions on which principles we should use in creating boundaries. So what I tried to do, I decided to uh, use uh, 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 invention of, I think, I, I'm not sure if it's Chinese who invented reverse engineering, but I would call it a reverse engineering approach uh, to this question. So I do know where the Soviet boundary was. And from its location, I will try to get back to the principles that, were, that went into its creation. Why, why, is it, why is this boundary in this location and not that location? What were the principles? And I uh, decided to uh, test it against three, uh, uh, well, should I say variables? Possibly. I wanted to see if the Soviet-made boundary which location I do know, followed uh, as an old boundary, which is in a specialized literature called anti tesant boundary, or did it follow any uh, geophysical features, or did it follow ethnographic logic? And uh, so if you compare the Soviet-made uh, boundary with the situation on the ground, you came up with, I came up with this map. And this is a map of South Ossetia, and I think you can see, yeah, the red dots are Ossetian settlements and uh, yellow dots are Georgian settlements. And the city is a very complicated case, by the way, because uh, city, South Ossetian Autonomous Region was uh, cut out of uh, two different gubernias. Uh, to show you the complexity of it uh, on top part of the map, uh, here is a divide. So to the west of this divide, uh, the rivers are flowing to the Black Sea. To the east of this divide, the rivers are flowing to the Caspian Sea. So they were joining together a uh, territory in one, uh, in one uh, administrative unit. Uh, the rivers of which were actually gener uh, originating on a divide of, uh, on a watershed uh, between Caspian and uh, Black Seas. Uh, and uh, the analysis of boundary shows an interesting, uh, interesting thing. Uh, there were two principles used. Uh, one principle was uh, ethnographic, I'll get to this a bit later, and the other principle was a clear combination of uh, geophysical features uh, with uh, old anti boundary. So let's say entire eastern boundary of South Ossetia uh, just followed an old uh, boundary of Uyezd, and at the same time it coincided with mountain range. The parts of the uh, western boundary of South Ossetia mostly followed the boundary range. What is interesting, when we get to the southern part where uh, Ossetian settlements meet Georgian settlements, the description of boundary is very, very precise. It usually the description, uh, I mean, it, it, the description of boundary at that time was usually done by the boundary goes to the left of this village or to the right of this village. 
And when you read, you just realize that the village which was left outside would be usually Georgian one, and which one would be left inside would be a Scythian one. So I think the entire south boundary was drawn along ethnographic principle. Now you can see that there were some Georgian settlements left inside the Ossetian territory, where ethnographic principle is obviously violated. And I have a political explanation for that. Uh, the Georgians uh, retained some Ossetian settlements which are not shown, but which are in this part. And I think in exchange, Ossetians retained a uh, town of, town of Tsukhin Valley, which is somewhere here. And uh, by consequence, they retained some Georgian villages. But the logic of drawing the boundary was mainly ethnographic in, in case of South Ossetia. Uh, this is an uh, unfinished yet map of Nagorno-Karabakh. So I'll just briefly go over the uh, significance of dots. The red dots are Armenian settlements. The green ones are uh, Turkic or Azerbaijani settlements. And the yellow ones, these ones, are Kurdish settlements. So, uh, uh, but first of all, let me just uh, briefly go over the boundaries of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. As I said, the decision was uh, to allocate this territory to Azerbaijan was taken on July 5th, 1921. And official declaration of Karabakh autonomy appeared in, uh, I think, July 7, 1923, so two years later. And usually in all textbooks and all books, this is an official date from which the Karabakh autonomy uh, is dated from. The interesting thing is uh, the actual text of this announcement is uh, literally a very small paragraph published in a Baku newspaper, which just says that the autonomy of Nagorno-Karabakh is proclaimed which doesn't say what was its status or what were its boundaries. So there was autonomy without boundaries and without the state institutions. Uh, actually, the, the first boundary description appeared uh, almost a year and a half later, in November 1924. And in 1925, a new kind of uh, description appeared, which was different from the first one. So you can see there was a very, very uh, difficult and very intensive struggle between Armenians and Azerbaijanis about where the boundary will go. And if you analyze this boundary, you will see again that uh, it almost copy-pastes the principles used in South Ossetia. On this part of uh, Karabakh, uh, the boundary where you don't have uh, many settlements because the terrain is very mountainous, uh, the boundary simply followed uh, uh, anti peasant principle and a uh, geophysical principle, almost one to one. And like in case of South Ossetia, once we go to the plains, we start uh, seeing implementation of ethnographic principle. Uh, in fact, the boundary, when you analyze the uh, ethnographic distribution of population with the location of boundary, you realize that actually the goal of the boundary was to separate Armenian uh, settlements from Turkic settlements. One area where this is different is this, in this region here. Like in, South, uh, like in case of South Ossetia, there were some political decisions regarding this territory. And this area in... Uh, late Tsarist times, was settled by Russian uh, colonists. And the Russian colonists were uh, expelled during the Civil War, and uh, they practically all of them moved to, uh, to Russia, to the original gubernias where they came from. So this area became a, uh, a spot of dispute be between Armenians and Azerbaijanis because uh, irrigation was uh, very well done here, and both sides claimed this territory. And there were very, very uh, tough uh, debates about who's going to get which part of this uh, uh, arable land. As you can see here, again, uh, this is uh, quite clearly ethnographically in front boundary, which tries to separate uh, two ethnic groups. So once again, Karabakh and South Ossetia, they follow almost the same logic here. Now, the reason I put Abkhazia the last uh, is, uh, is important. Abkhazia 
uh, uh, did not follow this logic at all. So I don't have a very clear case, uh, which you know you would say uh, all in all three cases they followed the same logic. Abkhazia is very different. Uh, first of all, the very surprising thing: uh, the Bolsheviks practically never uh, draw any boundaries of Abkhazia. And the reason why they didn't draw the boundaries of Abkhazia is uh, because Georgians and Abkhaz were pretty much in agreement about these boundaries. But I have to give you uh, a little bit of a background of Abkhazia. Uh, because uh, since the boundaries of Abkhazia were not the Bolshevik creation, I need to give you a background. So officially, uh, Abkhazia became part of Russian Empire in 1810. Uh, uh, but in practice, uh, Russians at best controlled only several settlements along the coast. Uh, that was uh, fortress in Sukhum and uh, uh, this is Gagra. This, this dot here is Gagra. Uh, so they basically controlled the coast, uh, had the, their garrisons, and they didn't interfere in the internal Abkhaz affairs. Uh, the things have changed after the conclusion of the Caucasian War. Uh, at, at, by the way, at, at, at times uh, there was no Russian presence in Abkhazia at all. For example, uh, during the Crimean War, Russians had to evacuate all their uh, fortresses along the coast because they couldn't provide, uh, couldn't supply their garrisons. So Abkhazia was completely out, uh, outside of Russian control. Uh, in, uh, with the conclusion of the war in the North Caucasus in 1864, Abkhazia was integrated into Russian Empire and uh, their autonomous status was uh, abolished and uh, it uh, was uh, proclaimed uh, Sukhumsky Vayenny Okrug, which you can translate as uh, Sukhum Military District. I'm sorry, Adyal. Uh, the Russian word is Adyal. <coughs> And in uh, 1864, a very important decision was taken. Uh, the boundary of Abkhazia uh, was changed. Uh, it ran uh, along uh, this line, which is dotted line here. And uh, the territory, this territory, was given to another Russian gubernia, which was newly created. And this territory was inhabited by... Uh, a tribe which was uh, very close to the Abkhaz. So Abkhaz were not very happy about it. So the boundary of Abkhazia started here along this line in 1864. At the same 1864, this territory, which is, if you follow the events, this is a modern Gali district. Uh, and this district, this area, this district was not part of Abkhazia before that, but it was uh, a source of... Uh, conflict between uh, princes of Abkhazia and princes of Mengrelia. And Abkhaz claimed this territory and Mengrels uh, claimed this territory. And in uh, 64, 1864, Russian administration decided to grant this territory uh, to Abkhazia. Uh, the next very important decision uh, regarding the Abkhaz boundaries occurred in uh, 1904. In 1904, a relative of Tsar, uh, Prince Odelburgsky, uh, decided uh, to create a clima climatic station. Now, it took me a while to figure out what climatic station meant, actually. He was not uh, going to do any uh, scientific research there, but it was a name of a luxury resort. So, this relative of Tsar decided to build a very luxury resort in Gagra in 1904. 1903, uh, the construction started, and the Tsarist authorities decided to separate part of uh, this district and joined it uh, to the Chernomorska gubernia, to Black Sea gubernia, separating it from Abkhazia. So the new border of Abkhazia ran along River Bzib, which you can see here. This is 1904. You already have uh, uh, national feelings. Uh, so the Abkhaz and Georgian public uh, very badly received this uh, separation, and they were petitioning the government for many years uh, to change it. 
so when the Tsarist Empire collapsed in 1917, almost the first thing uh, uh, was done, I think, already in March 1917, uh, the Georgian, uh, I don't remember his exact position, Chenkeli basically visited the region and petitioned the, uh, and the citizens of Gagra to petition the government in Petrograd to join uh, Abkhazia. Abkhazia was not called Abkhazia at the time, but Sohumsky, uh, Sohum district, or Sohumsky Okrug, I think. Three days before uh, the Bolsheviks took power in St. Petersburg, uh, the Georgian government petitioned the, I forgot how to say Vremen Pravitelstvo in English, provisional, provisional government. They put three days before the Bolsheviks overthrew uh, the provisional government, they petitioned uh, St. Uh, Petrograd to join uh, Gagra to Abkhazia. I don't know if the decision was granted, but I think it was. So technically, uh, by the time October Revolution occurred, Abkhazia uh, constituted territory between uh, river, uh, river Begepsta, or in Russian, Halodna Rechka, and uh, River Ingur. And then the Russian Revolution started and the civil war went into, uh, into play. Uh, so I have to kind of very briefly go over the events of civil war. Uh, in uh, February, in February 1918, the local government in Abkhazia petitioned the Georgian government to conclude a treaty, a treaty of uh, mutual help. Uh, I think the Abkhaz uh, authorities uh, had a flow of uh, Russian deserters uh, who were fighting from the Caucasian front and uh, they had trouble coping with this uh, uh, armed uh, armed crowds and uh, uh, this agreement I mean it wasn't a treaty it was an agreement actually included a clause on the borders of Abkhazia which should include the territory between Ingur river which is here which is uh, at that time current Georgia and Abkhaz border and Mazmata river Mazmata river is here So the Georgians and Abkhaz were, uh, came, were actually in, in good agreement about the boundaries of Abkhazia. Then in uh, February, March, uh, the Bolsheviks, with the help of retreating troops, they captured the authority of Sukhum, and uh, Georgians had to intervene. So you had a period of approximately three, four months where uh, uh, Abkhazia was under control of Bolshevik forces and the Georgians moved in trying to expel them. So this is uh, pretty much April, June uh, 1918. The Georgian forces were better, eventually prevailed and they pushed uh, the Bolshevik forces and started to advance. They advanced along the coast and went as far as to Apse. Up to here, this was summer 1918. In Toapse, they finally met with the uh, advancing uh, forces of uh, a volunteer army. The volunteer army uh, pushed the Georgians to the river Lu, which is here. So by approximately September 1918, this was uh, the line of contact between Georgian forces and the uh, volunteer army. In... Uh, at the end of September 1918, uh, there were negotiations between Georgians and Volunteer Army in Yekaterinodar. Uh, the Volunteer Army demanded unconditionally that the Georgians retreat to the old Abkhaz boundary, 1904 boundary, which is here. So from here, the Georgians had to retreat up to here. And the Georgians disagreed. So things stayed the same for a while uh, until in uh, February 1919, the Georgians had to remove lots of troops because there was war with Armenia uh, concerning Lori district. So the Georgians pulled the troops from, uh, from this region uh, to move them to Armenian front. And the volunteer army used this opportunity. So they uh, overwhelmed the Georgian garrison 
on River Lu and they pushed uh, Georgians to, I think, R River Bzib. Let me just check. They pushed each other so many times that I forgot. Yeah, they pushed them to the River Bzib. So the Georgians had to retreat to River Bzib. And this was February 1919. Well, in April 1919, the Georgians against profited from the fact that volunteer army didn't have troops on these borders because they were fighting Bolsheviks. And they started the offensive and they pushed uh, the volunteer army uh, to River Mehadir, which is here. You can see that. And that was the boundary between uh, the volunteer army and Georgian Republic until uh, the Sovietization of Georgia. Now, the, as I said, the Bolsheviks almost never played any role in boundaries of Abkhazia. Uh, the only occasion when they actually decided some boundary was uh, in May 1920. It was clear by that time that uh, the white forces are losing and the Georgians decided to conclude a treaty with the Bolsheviks. And this treaty, the Bolsheviks recognized the boundaries of Georgia. And according to this treaty, the boundary of Georgia ran along River Pso, which is, which is this. I'm almost finished. But when the Bolsheviks captured Georgia in February 1921, the Bolsheviks troops didn't stop at River Pso. Actually, never allowed the Georgians to advance to River Pso. But instead, they, uh, the administration of Sochi district uh, claimed uh, the old uh, border of Abkhazia along uh, Begepsta River. So along this river. Even so, the Bolsheviks promised the border of Abkhazia along this river. The de facto boundary in Soviet times, in early Soviet times, was along this river. It took Abkhaz almost 10 years with the help of Georgia to persuade uh, the government in Moscow to give this territory back to Abkhazia. The thing is, the territory was inhabited by, uh, not by Abkhaz, but by other minority groups. That's probably one of the reasons why uh, the, Sochi district, the Sochi administration was able to keep this territory for so long, because this, actually these people didn't want to join Abkhazia. Now that pretty much uh, decides, uh, kind of clarifies the question of Abkhaz boundaries. Uh, but there are interesting uh, problems here. First of all, if you look at the case of Abkhazia, you notice that all the boundary problems are along the northern boundary, along the Russian boundary. You have boundary along this river, along this river, along this river, this river, this river, here, here, and even here. And not a single uh, case of, uh, you know, boundary change attempts along the boundary between Abkhazia and Georgia. Uh, the second striking point is very little Bolshevik involvement in case of Abkhazia. Only May 7 decision to grant uh, the boundary along River Pso uh, was the Bolshevik decision concerning the Abkhaz boundaries. Uh, Another thing, if you look at this map uh, from ethnographic point of view, this part of Abkhazia, which uh, was, uh, which is current present day Gali region, and at that time was called Samurzakana region, is inhabited by, <laughs> by that time these people already recognize themselves as Mangrel. So this part was inhabited by Mangrel. And it might appear uh, strange that the Georgians who were in control of Abkhazia during the Civil War did not try to separate this part and join it to Georgia. And it's also funny that the Abkhaz, uh, who were not a very big uh, proportion of population of Abkhazia, did not try to get rid of this territory, so that would increase their proportionate numbers in Abkhazia. My understanding is that uh, the Georgians uh, did not want to uh, cut this part off because uh, they were hoping to keep the whole Abkhazia to themselves. And if you remove this uh, Georgian population from Abkhazia, the Georgian numbers, the proportion of Georgian population declines and it becomes more difficult to claim the entire Abkhazia. The Abkhaz, on the other hand, 
wanted to keep this territory because they hoped to uh, separate from Georgia and separating from Georgia they hoped to keep this territory. That's my understanding why there, there was no irredentist uh, movement uh, in this area. So finally I arrived to conclusion. Uh, so were the borders drawn in order to divide and rule? Or were they drawn to fit some uh, Bolshevik economic plans? Uh, I think they were not. I think they were a product of uh, very small decisions taken at a different uh, levels, which uh, once the decision is taken, it's very difficult to completely undo it. And I think it's a product of, uh, of this complicated decision making of the Bolsheviks rather than any, any central or, or even sinister plan to create the boundaries in this region. Thank you.